you, you were in the State House of Representatives. You served a term. Uh, there was an opportunity, and you uh, ran for and won in a special election the, uh, the uh, county council president. And now that another election's coming up, you're saying, I'm running for Congress. So tell me, how did you, how did you get involved in politics? How did you get here? Tell us a little bit about Tom Kovac. Well, well thanks, uh, thanks for letting me tell that story, Charlie, because it's, for me, I haven't been involved in politics for my entire career. I was an engineer, now I'm a recovering engineer. <laughs> uh, I went to University of Delaware, I got a degree in chemical engineering and psychology. Uh, wanted to uh, branch out, I worked for a couple years, worked at, uh, lived in North Wilmington, worked in Philadelphia, actually worked for the Environmental Protection Agency. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, working alongside with, with uh, attorneys, helping businesses comply with laws, I figured uh, this would be a good career for me because I can understand the technical component, but I really like the people interaction. So I decided to go into law. Uh, so I went to law school and uh, came out advocating for the last 15 years. I've been an environmental attorney, working with businesses, either s mostly small and medium sized, a few larger sized businesses, helping them com comply with these complex governmental regulations out there, helping them get profitable, but also comply with environmental laws and protect you know, our children, our grandparents, things like that. There's, there's a balance. And when right. we lose that balance, that's a bad thing. Well, as you said at the beginning of the show, in Delaware, unfortunately, we've lost our balance politically. Mm -hmm. So I was a regular voter in the 2008 election. I saw what happened. Well, all of a sudden, our balance got wiped out. As you mentioned, the state Senate has been Democratic forever. Our state House, however, had been Republican because people in Delaware are able to choose that they want a balance because they know that's good representation. Because when one party has control, the, the power actually goes from the elected officials who are accountable to the people. That party goes, the, the power goes to the party instead right. of the elected candidate. So that party ends up controlling instead of the candidate. Yeah, I, I'm sure you had friends in, across the aisle that told you, well, Charlie, I couldn't, I couldn't vote on this bill because my caucus locked me down. My caucus, which is your party, told you what to do. Right. I've had good friends, you know, Democrats, uh, fiscal conservatives tell me, hey, Tom, uh, sorry we couldn't vote that way on the bill. I wanted to, but I just wasn't able to. How in the world are you not able to do what you think is right the for right thing. your constituents, the citizens of Delaware? Well, because they cede that power because of this vast majority that the Democratic Party has. They have a lock on power, and that's not a good thing. So after the 2008 election, my state representative actually resigned. She resigned the day after the election because she started a job in New Mexico. Well, long story short, her party had talked to her into keeping her name on the ballot. She ran unopposed. I ran in a very, what you'd call, democratic district, from, from Edgemore all the way up to Claymont. Great people, great, you know, blue collar, working class people, very, you know, registered, very democratic. And uh, I said, look, this is, this is wrong. I want to give the people a choice. So I'd never been in a campaign, never been in an election, never even you know, door knocked for a candidate. I'd been at a few functions as, sure. as a business person and supported candidates you know, on both sides of the aisle that, that would do the best job. Um, so I decided to put my name out there. And I was fortunate and I was able to run as myself, run as a Republican, but run as myself, run as something that was concerned about the residents of the district that would really interested in representing them not a political party. So go figure, I won. Um, <laughs> as a Republican in, in North Wilmington, I won. But right. I won because people connected with the message. They connected with the reason why I was doing this. I had, as an attorney, I scratched and clawed and l good luck and good fortune. I got to be partner. Everybody wants to be partner when you're uh, you know, a lawyer. That's the, the, gra the brass ring. You want to be that partner. So a year after I finally got there, I got into public service. And because I didn't want there to be any conflicts of interest, I resigned my partnership. Hmm. So this isn't about money and uh, power and, and all that good, or free time. Right. It's about public service. I was an e I'm an Eagle Scout, a Boy Scout, uh, still active in the Scouts. I'm active on the Del Marva board. So I really am doing this for public service, and it's been great. Because running as yourself, you know, being in the party in the minority, you know, you get to stand up for what you'd want to. Um, but even then, there was opportunities for my caucus to lock me down and make me vote on certain things. Well, you have to have the courage. 
And far too of our elected officials, far too, as you know, Absolutely. have the courage to stand up and make the right decisions. I will freely admit, you know, on a taped television show that, that'll be replayed, that I have differed from the Republican Party. I have broken from my caucus and said, I need to do this because I think it's right. Mm -hmm. I need to support this piece of legislation because it's good for my representative district right. and it's good for the state. So that's what I'm about. So when I was in office, I never realized until I was in office what politics really meant to the individual, what it really meant to me. I was a citizen, I was a voter, but until you're there, until, as you know, until you're giving back to the community in that role, I thought it would be petty and bitter and uh, painful and uh, immature, and, and it was, and it is. I mean, <laughs> all of those things. All the above. But for me, there's been no more rewarding job than I've had than politics because it's, for me, it's public service, mm -hmm. and that makes a difference. And I'm, I know the same was true for you. So I saw you get out in front of bills and support bills that were good, respective of party, right. that, that advanced the ball. And when you can get down there and you do stand out, it makes a difference. And people always ask me, well, why now are you running for, for Congress? You're going to be the only representative from Delaware, which is an important thing, but one of 435. Well, yes, so you need an advocate. You, you need an engineer who's a problem solver. You need an attorney who's an advocate for you people. And you need somebody who is willing to stand up. I enjoyed my time in the state legislature. I got good things done. I made legislation that was headed in the wrong direction, corrected that course. I worked with the administration, who's the opposite party. I, I worked with uh, members of the General Assembly who were in the opposite party to get the right things to happen. And I, take, I took great pride in that, um, and I enjoyed that. And as you said, all of a sudden in Newcastle County, because of the 2010 election, the county council president came open. And somebody whispered in my ear, Tom, you should run for that. Mm -hmm. I said, well, hold it. It's Newcastle County. It's 50% Democratic and 30% Republican. You know, how in the world are we going to do this? And I looked at my election cycle in 2010 in my small rep district. Uh, Chris Coons won 64% to 32%, two to one. Right. And we broke down the numbers, and at the end of the day, I got a quarter of Chris Coons' vote to cross over and vote for me. Somebody that voted for a Democratic United States Senator, six lines down, found their local state rep, mm -hmm. and voted for me. And that meant, that was, that was probably one of the most rewarding things to me, right. because that meant my district knew that I, <laughs> I cared that I was out there active for them. I said, you know what, if we can do that on a county-wide basis, we can win. And sure enough, I was able to run as myself, run as a Republican, but one, run as a Republican you know, that, that cares about education, mm -hmm. cares about environmental issues, cares about getting the government out of the way of small businesses so the small businesses can be successful, so the small businesses can employ people, so the small businesses can get our economy going. And to me, that's what it means to be a good Republican. And you think, well, 50% of the counties registered Democrat, 30% is registered Republican. Even if somebody has good ideas, they're not going to have a chance. Right. Well, I think that's wrong. I think people are selling the people of Delaware and the people of Newcastle County short because I put out that message that I thought would connect with people that I knew connected with employers, knew connected with individuals and our families, and we won by over 15% as a registered Republican in Newcastle County. So I've been able to go down the county council, make a difference. Again, stand up. I'm not shy. Um, I'm not, not that shy. That is true. <laughs> that is absolutely true. There's been some 12 to 1 votes. I was the one. But those, when I made those votes and I stood up, I didn't just say no. I came out with a, with a message with an alternative. And we've actually implemented some of those things that I stood up for. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm looking to do the same thing in Congress. Stand up for the people. Stand up for the right things in Delaware. I am not going to Washington, D.C. to fight for my political party. I'm going to Washington, D.C. to fight for the people of Delaware. So that's why I'm running because I have that passion, because I have that fire in my belly, because I know if I spend all this time in politics and I spend all this energy and, you know, I see my family, you know, hit or miss, but I take them to political events with me and, and they go and my, my daughters have been involved in my campaigns and my son is out door knocking with me. People ask, how can you do that with your, with your young family? I have a 14-year-old daughter, a 13-year-old daughter, and a, and 
an eight-year-old son. But when we look at the direction the country is going, when we look at the, this is how we've always done it. Right. You know, Charlie, we have to do it this way. We, this is how we've always done it. When you look at what that philosophy has done for our government, we are in a boatload of trouble. Mm -hmm. It can be corrected, but it's going to take a lot of hard work, and it's going to take somebody to say, you know what? Some of these popular things that the government's been doing, quite frankly, to buy votes, right. that's got to stop. Right. We've got to take care of the large amount of citizens instead of taking care of a few select groups. And most of our politicians, when they get elected, turn into politicians. They turn into people that are looking to get reelected. How can I get my next job? How can I get reelected? Well, I think you do a good job and you worry about the reelection afterwards. Right. So. Well, and, 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 I, and I will say that, that while, uh, um, you know, while personally I like your opponent very much, uh, here's a guy that, that prior to, uh, to getting a government job, his first government job, had been a football coach for a year. Nothing wrong with being a football coach, but uh, um, then you get a government job, and you work government jobs for a little while, and then you get elected because you're Tom Carper's favorite, and then you just, you know, and, 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 and when you lose an election uh, in 2008 to, uh, to, to Jack Markell, you go to the private sector for two years and find out, oh my gosh, this private sector stuff is hard. I'm going to go get another government job, and uh, and you're the uh, anointed one for the political party, and it's it's all a power play. Well, it, to, to me, Charlie, it, you shouldn't vote for somebody because of their party, and you shouldn't also vote for somebody because you feel sorry for them because they, they they weren't in the position that they should have been, that the party thinks they should have been. There is no line, there is no entitlement as somebody that's put their time in government to move up that spectrum. As a matter of fact, you have to make sure that a good administrator, again, my, my opponent in the November election, you know, by all accounts was a good administrator, you know, and he's a really nice guy. And you know what? I like him personally too. I just saw him on Friday at, at a fundraiser for, for a charity. I spent a, a few minutes talking to him. I really do like him. He's a nice guy. But that doesn't mean that he's the best choice for Delaware. Right. That doesn't mean that, you know, he is going to be the one to lead our state in a very difficult environment. Right. Again, I'm an attorney. I'm used to those battles. But I'm also used to those battles in a productive way. Mm -hmm. As Delaware attorneys, we argue vigorously for our clients. We advocate for our clients. And we battle. But we do so in a respectful manner because you never know when you're going to need the help of that other attorney across the way. You right. make sure that you carry yourself in a productive and dignified and manner with civility so that you can reach out to that attorney on the other side and shake their hand after that argument. And that's what we've lost in Washington. Mm -hmm. I mean, Washington's really gone polarized. You know, oh, that's terrible. Uh, it, it, it's awful. People you always need to advocate for your sides because and I just actually started teaching uh, uh, political science at Wilmington University. And the students are very frustrated with this two-party system because you hear from the far right and the far left. Mm -hmm. and I said, well, you know what? Most of the folks can work together. But when, again, when they get elected, they find themselves appealing to the masses. Now, in my political campaign for Congress, actually, my, my fundraiser has gotten mad at me because she goes, you need to take more extreme positions. You <laughs> need to say, I'm never going to raise taxes or I'm going to do this on an issue. Well, you know what? That's irresponsible because right. you don't know what's going to happen when you get down there. Now, I'm going to fight for less of a financial burden on our families. Right. I'm going to fight for less financial burden on our businesses, less regulatory burden. But we can't go in and say, we're going to eliminate the EPA, right. uh, you know, the Environmental Protection Agency. That gets a lot of votes and that gets a lot of money. But that's not the truth and right. that's not realistic. And right. what we need to do is advocate for those proper perspectives. When you find yourself representing the edges, then you're not representing the people. And my opponent is a nice guy. And I think, you know, he might not fall in these extremes, but I don't know really where he falls because, again, he's not getting out and taking a leadership position on some of these very important issues facing our country. I, I, I think that, that he, generally speaking, has been a guy in the caucus. 
tell me what I'm supposed to do and I will go and do that. I'll be nice about it. When I go meet other people, I'll be nice. And, and, but you tell me what I'm supposed to do and I will do it. And, uh, and therefore, he'll get the, the office or he'll get this committee assignment or he'll get money for this road project or something like that. They'll you know, sort of pay for that. Uh, and, and, and I mean, that's the, the game that's played. I mean, it's played in Dover. Uh, it's played big time in Washington because they have a lot more money. Uh, and, and what you really need is somebody that's got the, the independence and the backbone to say, you know what, yeah, it would be great to be on this committee or that committee, but, but that's not as important as what are the overall decisions being made for my state and my country and what's the right thing to do. Well, and, and that's it. And that when you are an elected official, you, and, and as you did, you take this responsibility very seriously. I am a representative of the people of my state. Again, I'm not a representative of a party. I'm not a representative of a political interest group. I'm not a representative of my biggest donors. What I am is I'm a representative of the people. But you have to make decisions that are in the people's best interest. And those special interests and the big parties, organizations, can spin it and tell the people that what you're voting for isn't in their best interest. But you have to have the courage to lead because you have that information. And as a, a famous local uh, governor once said at, at, at a dinner that we were both at, as a true public servant, it's not my job to follow the polls. It's my job to make the polls. Right. I get out, I take a stand on the right issues, whether it's popular or not, because I have the information and I know that it's best for my constituency. Right. It's not my job to follow what you know, special interests or party control thinks is, is in the be best interest of the people, because it's not. Because, again... Well, and, and, and educating a voter takes a long time. And, and so many of our uh, uh, elected officials just default to the soundbite and don't actually get out and, and begin a process of educating voters on important issues. So, you know, you get the, the health care debate and it all comes down to, to this soundbite versus that soundbite versus what is the right way to try to get 20 percent of the economy functioning in a way that, that is affordable or as affordable as possible, yet provides a, a, a high quality of equal access health care across all economic strata. And, and that's a complicated conversation to have, but we refuse, or not we, I, but I think that, that the elected officials, and frankly I think a lot of the media, refuses to engage in that actual conversation. And, and you know, I listen on, on, the, on the radio and the news to, to CNBC and Bloomberg, because I just, I, I like listening to business news and whatever. And they'll get representatives and senators on and they'll talk about some issue and immediately it's just the sound bite against the sound bite. Well you just want to throw grandma off a cliff. Well you just want to, you know, tax uh, people so that the business goes somewhere. I mean, you know, it's, could we just stop? Could we just stop and, and have a conversation about how do markets work and how does the education system work and, and that kind of thing. Well, and that, but, but as you know, Charlie, unfortunately, unless you have somebody willing to do that job and do it the right way, unless you have somebody willing to step forward and with the background and education and experience to do so, we're going to get more of the same. And we can't afford more of the same. We need a leader to go in and say, look, what is the right answer? It depends. It depends what the situation is. I'm not going to come in and say, you know, oh, this, this health care bill, we've got to throw it out because all 100% of this bill is awful. Well, you know what? Right. There are actually good parts to that health care bill. Right. Now, the whole package has sold to the American right. public. It is, there's so much bad with the good. 2,700 <laughs> pages of anything. I mean, if, if try to pass the phone book. I mean, it's just that. But you, it, you, there's, there's no reason we can't pass these things in parts. Right. And there's and no that's reason. That's what should have happened. Let's break but this it's out not, and that out. It's not sexy, Charlie, because then you have the harder time <laughs> passing those bits and pieces that and are less popular. And you have to educate popular. the voters. And, and who to wants to do voters. that? Right. That takes too much time to educate the voters. And it's easier to say, we'll pass the bill, then you'll know what's in it. And that is the wrong thing to do. We, we need we need elected officials that are going to get in, educate the voters, because they, they've themselves gotten educated. And I will tell you, the one promise I will make is I will never, ever sign or vote for a bill that I haven't read. <laughs> That's going to be a lot of, <laughs> lot of reading, 2,700 pages. But let me, let me this, Tom Kovac, 
You're currently uh, Newcastle County Council president. You're running for Congress on the Republican ticket. Uh, if somebody wanted to, to, to get more information about you or, or what have you, do you have a, a website? Absolutely. One of the things that we like to do is, is make sure that we reach out to people. We have a website. It's your standard website. It's got some good general information on it. And we hope you look at it and get interested. But then call me, write to me, email me, Twitter me, Facebook me. Send me an instant message. I want to hear from you. Every week we send out an email to the community saying this is what an important issue is. What are your thoughts? I want to develop a dialogue with the voters because the voters are the ones that I need their input. I don't want to tell everybody how it is. I want to get solicit input from the citizens. And I want to say, look, this partisan rhetoric, this one party rule, the majority of the state's Democratic Party is not always serving your best interest. Look at the best candidate. Develop a relationship with that candidate because this is Delaware and we can do that in Delaware. Vote for the best candidate. I want to educate you. I want you to educate me. And I think together we'll make a better Delaware. That's why I'm running for Congress. I would proud to be your representative, one representative from Delaware in the United States House of Representatives. I'm looking for your support. I'm looking for your vote. I'm looking for your feedback. I, I look forward to hearing from you. And Charlie, thank you for having me on your show. Absolutely. Uh, and the, the website address is? www. Kovacforcongress.org. Kovacforcongress.org. Or you could Google. Kovac for Congress. Now, is it for the F -O -R. number four? F O U R. Uh, uh, or F O R. F not, not, not four. Yeah, four. No, yeah, no, no, yeah. See, I, I'm not, I know how to spell just the wrong one. That, that's right. <laughs> uh, unlike other candidates, I'm, I'm not selling my candidacy. It's not F O R. Oh, right, right. right. It's, a, uh, but, it's uh, right. <laughs> Kovac, F O R, Congress. Congress. Or even more simple, go Google. Google. You know, Kovac Congress Delaware or Tom Kovac Delaware. You'll find enough things on the web. I've been in the paper enough because I've stood up for the right things. And uh, there's enough stories. Do your research. You know, look at your candidates. The best prediction of future action is past action. Do I stand up for what you want to stand up for? I think I do. I want to get more educated about the issues impacting our voters statewide. I'm very familiar with Newcastle County. I'm getting down to Kent and Sussex County. But we have some serious issues in our urban areas, our cities, our suburban areas. We have growth issues that I deal with on the county. We have uh, you know, issues with you know, reinvesting and, and getting our cities going again. I've been in Wilmington. I've been in more ribbon cuttings in Wilmington than anywhere else because I think we need to focus in on Wilmington because if we ignore Wilmington, which is easy to do for politicians running statewide, we do so at our own peril. It can be the financial and cultural hub of our state and really spread a positive message about Delaware emanating from Wilmington. That's great. Well, we've, uh, we've spent the last half hour talking to Tom Kovac, who's the Republican candidate for Congress in 2012. And, and I know a lot of viewers out there uh, have probably already made up their mind as to who they're going to vote for President of the United States. And I have no problem with that. I think that's a, a, a wonderful thing to do. Uh, but I would just ask that we have a lot of great candidates on both sides of the aisle in the state of Delaware. And Delaware has been controlled by one party for a long, long time. And I believe in competition. I believe we have great local Republican candidates who may not really be the same kind of Republican candidates that you sometimes see in the presidential elections and things like that. Some of them are, some aren't. But it's incumbent upon, upon the voter to know who the, who the people are out there. What do they stand for? And today with the internet, uh, with telecommunications uh, and, and stuff like that, you can find out a lot about a candidate. You, uh, Tom Kovac has a voting history, both in Newcastle County Council and in the State House of Representatives. Uh, you can go see what, what he's about. Here's a guy that was an engineer, chemical engineer, became an attorney to work on environmental issues to help small businesses work their way through government bureaucracy uh, while protecting homeowners and families, uh, then that's a great set of skills to then bring to elective office. And so I hope you give uh, Tom serious consideration. And with that, uh, the next half of the hour, we're going to replay an interview that I had with, uh, with Kevin Wade a few weeks back. Kevin Wade is running for the U.S. Senate uh, as a Republican candidate here in the state of Delaware. And I hope you, you listen to what Kevin has to say as well. So with that, I will...